I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Todd Dean, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in St. Louis, Missouri. Something that's... This morning I was working on bills to send to patients, and I was... Something that's been on my mind a lot lately is, and it, it seems very culturally relevant at the moment, but is the whole business of psychiatric diagnosis, like, you know, when we bill somebody, we have to give them a diagnosis to, to get, and the diagnoses, um, the, the whole DSM thing seems so completely irrelevant to any realistic appraisal of what's going on with somebody, yet it's the only way things can work. And it it occurred to me today, after I'd done this, and that it it's it's kind of like the whole, you know, neoliberal system. Like there was um, there was a great article by the economic historian Adam Tooze in um, dissent uh, about a year ago where he was talking about the the way e- economics is studied you never question the fundamental issues you may say well you invest a little bit more in stocks than in bonds but you never question this is the best way to work it and that's kind of the way the DSM is and but now the the systems, it's pretty clear both those systems don't really work well. And so now you can sort of radically question what what are we doing in a way that you couldn't do. I mean, I guess you could, but it, it just was not a front burner issue for many people um, not too long ago. It's It's these last couple of years have made everybody question fundamental issues, I think, in a lot of different parts of our culture. But um, I'm teaching a class on, um, it's some pe- people wanted a, sort of an introduction to Lacanian theory, but I'm also making it relevant to kind of cultural issues. And, uh, and um, so I, I started with a paper by uh, an article from Harper's Magazine by uh, Gary Greenberg, who's a psychologist and a journalist, and and he's been critical of this stuff for years. Um, but it seems to me today it's much more. We got to do something about this. This is not not a good system. That's a really good point. I mean, when I was in graduate school getting a doctorate in psychology, I didn't even know that you could work outside of the DSM. I thought that's just the way it was. It wasn't questioned, and you had to diagnose people. You had to pick one of these things, and there was no other way of working. I mean, nothing else was presented outside of it. Right. Well, and that's interesting. Now, how did you get to... uh get outside of it and, and, and to be psychoanalytic. I mean, I, I mean, I trained at my psychiatry residency was at one of the places that was the biggest, one of the biggest pre DSM three research places. And that was Washington university here in St. Louis. And, uh, the research diagnostic criteria w- were developed by psychiatrists here, and that was one of the precursors of the DSM-3. Um, so it was all around me. But I mean, well, I mean, I can answer the question for me. Is I, I mean, even I. It's it's funny because I was had to look for something in old notebooks and 
I was looking at things I'd written back when I was in training and I was clearly, there were things I was very skeptical of even then. Like, um, I remember on the geriatric psychiatry unit, there was a, a patient, um, an older woman, and her normal day was to get out of bed, go into the other room of the house and turn on the television and watch TV. And then one day she did get out of bed, but she didn't turn the TV on anymore. And that was what we checked off was that was anhedonia. That was the anhedonic state. So that her, she didn't take pleasure in things that normally gave her pleasure. But even then I thought, well, this is crazy. What kind of a life is that? That all you do is shuffle between the bed and the TV room. And so, I mean, I've always in the back of my head was sort of skeptical, but I was, I guess I was like split, like, because at the same time, I just kind of went with it. I didn't, I didn't say to hell with you. I'm not going to put up with this, uh, but, and, and maybe we just didn't have any choice, but anyway, that, yeah, but it's presented as that this is the authority and this is what you're being told to do. This is the way it yeah. works. What do, what do you know when you're a student? You know, most students haven't studied it that much until they're in school for it. How would you know how the field works, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, I guess that was, yeah. You I just, had read a lot of Freud and Jung before. And I just went into graduate school. I didn't understand that the field was so divided between psychoanalysis and CBT and behavior therapy and all of these things. I just always thought they were like all different lenses that you could look at people through. Um, yeah. Like, oh, maybe this cognitive reframing might help at this point. But clearly you have to eventually get to the deeper underlying issues. But, you know, maybe relaxation training could help at some points. I thought it was kind of a more eclectic world <laughs> when I went into graduate school. So I didn't particularly look for graduate school that was psychoanalytic because I didn't know I had to. Um, and then I just went to the one that was, you know, nearby where I grew up. And yeah. uh, and then when I got there, I was like, what is this? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to show my patient a chart of happy faces and sad faces and ask them where they are when they're like a 60-year-old adult, you know? <laughs> I don't want to do that. And my supervisors would be like, well, even though you, we, you want to work psychoanalytically, like, you don't have to do what we recommend. And then by the end of the semester, my supervisor would be like, we have to do what we recommend for you to do sometimes. And I was like, no, like, I'm just not going to treat adults like that. That's not right. Yeah. yeah. So when I went, but then I ended up working in hospital systems after that because that's the way we were trained. And then when I got to, I got a job at a hospital HIV clinic in New York and I already knew Jameson. Jameson and I have been friends since we were like 13. Um, so Jameson was trained psychoanalytically because she was in New York for college and grad school and was like everybody had a psychoanalytic lens there, which was really nice. So she had just started analytic training. And so I was like, well, that's where I'll go to then because that's what I had originally had in mind to do. I just didn't understand I was going to go on this kind of detour first. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. Well, you knew what I, I didn't know what I was going to be doing until I had to work my way there. But well, you yeah. have an MD. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I, I wanted to be a writer and Chekhov and William Carlos Williams went to medical school. So I thought I'd go to medical school <laughs> and then that's what I, and that, that, was a much more circuitous route, but um, I almost went to medical school because I was like, "Well, Freud was a neurologist, so I wanted to actually go to get my MD too." But when I was yeah. looking at the programs, I saw that you would take like even for, in psychiatry, you take like two psychology classes, and it was just like being becoming a regular doctor. And I was like, eh, "This is not what I want to do." So yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't if if you knew you wanted to be a Psychologist, you see. I think I thought I was going to be a pediatrician when I started. I just, I just kind of so graduated. How did you fall into psychoanalysis? Uh, 
Well, I I think it's part of it is what I like. The way we're being taught doesn't fit with the way I experience people being. I mean, I, I think you're right. There there are things you can do that, that one that are helpful that aren't psychoanalysis, but at the end of the day, you you got to. If you really want to get to the heart of the problem, you've got to look at what's the real problem. Um, and uh, so there was that. And another uh, kind of a, um, a, a big thing for me. So I started my training in psychiatry in 1987 and the, the year I started, there was this new publishing house called Dalkey Archive was publishing these. They came out and they were publishing. There was a writer named Gilbert Sorrentino. And I've, you may have heard me talk about this guy before, but I just kind of fell in love with Sorrentino. But he, he was very much um, – he actually – in places says nice things about psychoanalysis, but, but I mean, it wasn't a big deal. It's, he didn't talk about it a lot, but he very much talked about kind of the difference between how we talk about things and how we perceive things and how things are. And there, that was in all his work, that's a, a constant theme. And, and that seemed to me very, very important. And I think so, I became a Sorrentinian psychoanalyst in the sense that I was looking at how is the way we talk about something influencing what we see. And that, that to me was very important. Uh, big difference in what I did going forward. But, I mean, I stayed on the faculty at Washington U for years after I graduated so I didn't it's not like I was running to psychoanalytic training I guess I had a pretty standard view of what psychoanalytic training was going to be I was that age but, well, but anyway your, your paper for the violence book on psychoanalysis and violence book uh is similar to what you're talking about with diagnosis, the, the paper on how to measure what on notes on universals right. and particulars. And I think right. that that point of view is really important. Right, right. And and that came out of reading, I mean, the, the clinical work I was talking about and that way of looking at what was going on, I, I feel like I owe first to reading Sorrentino and then like, you know, the, the, the literature I reference is uh, Lacan's seminar on the analytic act where he uses Charles Sanders Pierce a lot. And, and that seemed to me a really part of the puzzle of how these things work. Yeah. Do it you was, want to talk about that paper a little bit? <laughs> Well, we can. Uh, I uh, see that that seminar of Lacan's was. I really like that. I don't know what led me to read it to sort it out. I can't remember what caught my interest because it still hasn't been published even in French, uh, and it's just. I mean, like Miller has not published it. It's just. Uh, just these, uh, uh, you know, people have that have been published, and the that the Irish Lacan uh, Cormac Gallagher has published a translation of those notes, um, but he was, I mean, the the great thing, or a, a great thing in there is he was talking about the example of Pavlov and like the Pavlovian experiment with dogs, um, 
you know, the, the way the story gets told is Pavlov discovered something very important about, you know, dogs. But, but really, the important thing was what they told us about Pavlov and about what somebody, you know, this is what he wanted to do. That, I mean, it, it, it totally changes the way you look at it. And in, in a way, when we're talking about the DSM issues, especially it seems to me today, it's very, uh, the DSM looks incredibly ideological. There's nothing uh, value neutral about it. It's, it's about getting back to work and what you need to do to get back to work uh, to a very large extent. Um, and uh, so that was part of what went into that. And then in the clinical work, I w was working with an agency that treated um, immigrants. And I was particularly interested in working with Bosnians because, as you may know, uh, St. Louis, since the, the, the war in the 1990s and, and, and the former Yugoslavia, St. Louis is the second largest Bosnian city in the world after Sarajevo because a lot of people came here. Um, but I was interested in working with this population. I, some people had asked me to be more involved. And, but I had to do, in working with this agency, I had to fill out all this paperwork, which was about things like DSM diagnoses and, and you know, symptom reporting and improvement, rates of improvement and stuff like that. And um, so constantly looking at that, you know, kind of having that empiricist approach put under my nose, like I couldn't go forward until I'd filled out several pages of notes or, or of, uh, questionnaires on how they're doing and stuff. And, and it also seemed to me ridiculous because I was even told you can always show improvement. It's like, it's just a matter of how you write it up. Like you, there should never be a report that doesn't show improvement. Uh, so, which again, just doesn't fit with the way the world works. Um, but uh, so I was kind of forced to look at all that stuff at the same time. And I think just before that, I had been reading uh, the seminar um, on the analytic act. And it was, it was striking, you know, I like in the, I give an example in one case of somebody who had a great deal of anxiety about speaking because of events that happened in the war, uh, becoming able not only to speak uh, Bosnian, but to speak English. I mean, he'd been here a long time. He just never allowed himself to speak English. And part of it, I mean, I, I think that was a, an improvement that was related to dealing with what he'd gone through, but it, it doesn't show up in the DSM anywhere. You can't claim speaking a second language is proof of improvement in your PTSD, something like that. And, um, but yeah, I, I was really into that paper. <laughs> I like that. And that's really important because that was my experience when I worked in the government clinic was like by all of my time was spent filling out these forms and making sure that there was like one form to fill out every month and one form to fill out every three months and then different yeah. grants every six months and then something else every two weeks. And it was just like half the time my patients would come in, I would have to be like, all right, well, we have to fill out this and this today because <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't have time to do it outside of session because I was seeing like more to than me. one person an hour. Yeah. And I was seeing usually two or three people an hour. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's crazy. And 
Um, it just turns into case management. I'm like, why are they paying a psychologist to do this? This is just case management. Right. Yeah, and it, I, I left that agency shortly after I, there was something political that I, I didn't understand. Why were you doing, why was I doing this? Or, you know, what, what's the point? Um, and I, but I felt like somebody was getting something that I didn't know what they were getting. So, um, um, so I left, but, but yeah, I mean, the other thing to me though is, and maybe it's different and like around in New York with the Umbahagen, and I think it's somewhat different in Europe, but like the psychoanalytic establishment in America doesn't seem very interested in fighting this, uh, even though there's like uh, Jonathan Shedler's done research on the the statistical basis of evidence-based treatments showing that they're, they're really not good. Uh, you know, Steen Van Hula's book on uh, psychiatric diagnosis, is, he's got some really shocking revelations about the, the way statistics were manipulated in the development of the DSM-3 and 4 and 4R and 5. That, I mean, they, the most rigorous criteria for acceptability were with the DSM-3, and then with each subsequent version, they relaxed the criteria enormously. So what was, what was excellent in the DSM-5 was not even acceptable in the DSM-3. So um, it's, you know, somebody's been playing the game. Nobody seems to take this up very seriously. I, and I truly am not sure I understand why. It's kind of bothersome to me. It's a good point. Instead of just being kind of outside of it, why isn't it being addressed more head on? Yeah. Yeah. It's like we just have to put up with it instead of, yeah. Well, and especially now, like with this, all this, these lawsuits and everything that's going on with like the Sackler family, and they're like very clearly showing how they've like basically lied about the benefits of these medications <laughs> for a long time, yeah. and then yeah. this like whole generation, couple generations of doctors have been trained to like hand these things out, and they're they're clearly not good for people. Um, so yeah. you know that system hopefully is. I don't know if it's crumbling, but at least it's having a dent put in it. <laughs> and it's the same, you know, it's the same kind of mentality. Huh. You, you know, you bring that up, and that reminds me, I, one of the things I did when I was on the faculty of the medical school was, they call it consultation liaison psychiatry. So it's like, if the surgeon wants a psychiatrist to see a patient, they call it consult liaison psychiatrist. So I, uh, I was a, I was this psychiatrist on the uh, pain management program at there, and uh, this is this well, two things. One is, yeah, there was no questioning of the value of using meds. There, there was sort of a just don't give too many, uh, don't let them sell them, but you. There was no reason not to keep using them. And there was this sort of, um, somebody had said that people who have real pain, they don't become addicts. And there was no research basis for that, but that's, that was just became dogma for a long time. And as now we know, that's not right. But, but, but the other thing about it, that I, the big experience for me doing that service, it goes back to your question of what made me become a psychoanalyst. So I'd always kind of been, like I had psychoanalytic supervisors and saw patients privately, you know, my, my own patients I'd see for therapy, you know, for like more dynamic kind of therapy. But 
what I observed in that service a lot was things that seem like a reasonable, like if I'm having pain, I'll do this so that I don't hurt as much. There was a lot of not doing what seemed like the reasonable thing just to get rid of the pain. So there was a lot of jouissance on the service and you saw it all the time. And I thought we have no theory for why somebody, why this would happen. You know, why wouldn't you just, if, if the medicine makes you feel better, why don't you just take the medicine? Uh, or if doing the physical therapy makes you feel better, why don't you just do the physical therapy? And, and people would kind of keep themselves in these, this place of not doing well. And we had no way to address that. Uh, and no way to understand it. And there was nothing outside of psychoanalysis. I don't think there's any theory for understanding that issue. Uh, so that's, that's the other thing that made me become a psychoanalyst. Uh, How did you come across Lacan? Oh, I know. Um, Well, I, I think early on I read some stuff by uh, Christopher Bolas in which he references Lacan. Well, Bolas and Adam Phillips reference Lacan in a couple of places. And then I, I read when I was really just getting into uh, the training uh, or getting ready for training, I read – some reference to his notion of the transference to the subject presumed to know. And I thought that was an incredibly um, useful idea because, I mean, everybody else, that talk, when they talk about transference, they would talk about, you know, you, you're, you're transferring your, something about your dad to your therapist or something like that. And, okay, that's there, but so what? And the so what is that you're doing this because that person needs to be very important. You have made that person very important to you. Um, and that, and important to you specifically in that they know something that's going to help me. You know, that person knows something that's going to help me. Um, and that was a big deal. That was a very valuable thing I saw about Lacan. But then you start actually reading Lacan, and it, it took a lot of work. I, there were some years spent reading Lacan. I didn't, didn't jump on that right away. Actually, I got to Lapla Lacan through Laplace. I read Life and Death and Psychoanalysis before I read, I think, before I read anything about Lacan, so, which was also a very good book. Um, uh, but I, the last time I taught a class on psychosis, uh, a while back and one of the students said about when Lacan says what the analyst is, is a secretary to the psychotic. Uh, he said, that was the most practical thing anybody has ever said about working with a psychotic. And that I thought that was true, you know, that he does say really very, in a way, very straightforward, practical things about what to do. It's just the, the context in which he says them can be sort of hard to follow. So, uh, yeah, but the gems pop out. Yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're very... Real gems, yeah, they're, they're very good. Um, and I liked so that, yeah, you there isn't a paper in the Acree that doesn't have a really valuable points to at least think about. And, and B, if you do your research, which you really ought to do, and read the, the papers he references. Um, you you get a pretty good education when you when you read read him. So that is very yeah. true. Uh, 
I'm, I'm doing some work on the paper Science and Truth now. So I'm, I'm having to go back and read St. Augustine's On the Trinity. So it's, uh, because he references it all through there. So, but, and he doesn't really say what the point is exactly, but I know there is one, so I'll, I'll get there. What are you working on now? Well, I'm just, it's just trying to work on a paper on, well, and actually in this, I, I've become, now that I've sort of rejected the DSM and evidence-based therapies, I've, become interested in the question of science in psychoanalysis. So what, when we talk about science and psychology, what are we talking about? And, you know, there's a great paper by Darian Leader and Bernard Burgoyne in the, in Leader's book, Freud's Footnotes, where they talk about, it's called Freud's Scientific Background. And they they talk about the whole question that, you know, philosophers starting with Kant had about how can psychology be a science when it can't be uh, reduced to mathematical formulas? You know, you don't, there's no science of the psyche in that sense. And so they, but they, they looked at it very differently. Well, they looked at it very differently from what, we mean today by evidence-based treatments or like the, the science behind the DSM, which is there really is no science to the DSM except the statistics. You know, you, you come up with some symptoms that you group together. I've never seen anybody who, you know, it, it, well, let me rephrase that. If somebody presents and just looks like, they have a DSM diagnosis, end of story. My inclination is to think that they've, they just, they're very guarded in what they want to tell me. And they just want to tell me what they need to tell me to get the medicine or whatever. But the truth is, if five people come to you and say, I have, I'm, I have panic attacks, as you get to talking to them, you get five totally different stories of what's happening. They don't, look anything at all alike. Um, and this really, I think, is sort of the, this fact about how the mind works uh, is foundational for what I think Freud and Lacan and, and really Beyond and others see as a, if there's any science here, it starts with the awareness that there is this, um, a, a very idiomatic relationship between what we perceive and, I mean, what we're looking at and how we perceive what we're looking at, or what we're thinking and how we, or how we verbalize what goes on. Um, and so that's what I'm kind of interested in right now. So. And, uh, and the book that, Lichtenstein, that David Lichtenstein and uh, uh, the Baileys edited about the Lacan tradition, Burgoyne has a much longer paper on Lacan's research program. And it's, again, he's kind of coming back to this issue of what is it that we talk about when we talk about a science of the mind? I've just been very intrigued. So that's what I'm trying to work on. Is there anything coming up that you should know about? Uh, well, there's um, the, the Accre Conference at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh is coming up. I don't know yet if I'll be part of that, but I mean, I, it, I'm hoping to go. It seems like it'd be a great, a great thing to go to. It, it's got lots of good people there. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, that's the big thing coming up that I'm aware of. And that's um, in October. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's in the second weekend in October, I think. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the big one. What, what are you looking forward to? There's a lot happening in Stockholm next month, which is kind of fun because basically huh. everyone I know from New York is coming over here. There's the <laughs> SIP conference, the International Society for Psychoanalysis and Philosophy. Oh. Um, and they're having their 11th meeting in Stockholm, uh, May 2nd to 4th. So they, they had their conference in uh, New York. It was exactly the same weekend or the weekend after Trump was elected. <laughs> so it was like from Thursday to Saturday that week. So it's like the election happened. And then like all these philosophers and analysts were sitting at the new school, like trying to present their papers on other things. And, oh, <laughs> and the room was very I'm, heavy. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you every, were there. Everybody in New York was shocked. Just they, they the, <laughs> We were in, yeah, we it, were all in a state. <laughs> that's for sure and there were protests going on outside and everything and yeah. some people yeah. changed their 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 paper to talk about it because it was just like what's happening um <laughs> so yeah so they said then that they were going to have a conference in stockholm but when that happened i didn't know i would be leaving living in stockholm <laughs> when they had I, that conference so that's kind of fun <laughs> So Jameson and Patricia Gervici and uh, Alyssa Martyr and Evan Malader and uh, a bunch of people, Hannah Wallerstein, a bunch of people are going to be here for that. So that's going to be fun to have like the New York crew in Stockholm. And that's also funny because Sweden is the country that Trump said, we need to have more immigrants from Sweden, right? It's, it's, it's like... It's, and why would we go there? Yeah, they don't want to go. <laughs> I will say they love the U.S. though. Like they love American stuff and Americans and they love speaking English. And I think everyone feels sad for America right now and the world. Okay. <laughs> We're all going through a, uh, something together, I think. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's yeah. it does seem to me like the assumptions about how the world works in a lot of ways ha are coming into question now, and and that's a good thing, and it's the one reason I'm not sorry he got elected as long as we can act on it. I mean, I feel like if it had gone the other way, we'd be talking about emails every day for four years and uh, n nothing would change. But now there's real reasons to think, what the hell are we doing? To question yeah, what's going it's a on. symptom. So. He's like <laughs> the symptom that got everyone's attention. It's like the symptom comes knocking. If you don't listen, eventually it's just like in your face. <laughs> yeah. And you have to do something. So clearly uh, this right. is this is our this is our symptom. It's like, yeah. hey, what are, how did this happen, guys? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah, Maybe something needs to be adjusted here. Back in like 2015, the social sociologist Jody Dean, uh, who teaches at Rutgers, and she wrote in her blog, um, she called Trump the candidate of truth. And her point was everybody else sort of covers over the fact that this is, they're depending on big money and, and, and he just, he's just blunt about it. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. This has been going on under the surface for decades. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 what I keep saying. It's like, it's just true. It's like yeah. this has been going on for a long time, and all the senators that everyone's complaining about now, it's like they've been doing this exact same thing. Like to them, they're all like, "This is just business as usual." Yeah, this is what yeah. they've been doing. It's just now everyone's paying attention. Like, wait, right. why are they doing this? 
why doesn't the president have any rules, <laughs> basically? <laughs> and no, then you have people like Ocasio-Cortez, like, just saying it directly. Like, what is this, you know, which nobody's been doing before. So. Right. It, it, yeah, it looks shocking and uncivil for to say stuff like that. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Okay. Is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't get to? Uh, seems like we covered a lot. Um, we didn't talk about psychoanalytic training. <laughs> yeah, and you run a group there. Oh, the study group. I've got a Lacan study group. Yeah, um, yeah. I, we, yeah, we do. We had to take kind of a break because everybody got too busy. It's it's mostly it's a small group now, and that's one of our one of our problems. We've been together a really long time, and so and we've read a whole lot, and so people just beginning they don't like. I mean, they don't get much out of that group because it's too advanced. So we're trying to do more for people, trying to do more other stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've become a lot more skeptical about sort of the whole training institution. I mean, I know you guys went through that a big, in a big way um, in New York uh, some years back, but. It, it's very discouraging to me that like the American psychoanalytic keeps being caught in its own fights and it doesn't look at the larger issues. I mean, I, I really think psychoanalysis is feels threatening to the status quo. I mean, and because we bring things into question, it's like that, what I was saying about uh, you, if you just, maintain the paradigm and you say, well, you, you know, you have a few more symptoms here and a few more diagnoses and, or whatever, then there's no threat to the status quo and nobody's questioning the ideology behind the status quo. But when you start talking about what's the underlying issue, um, that's scary to the system. And, and I guess that's, I, and Psychoanalysis is the way to do that, uh, I think. I mean, you, even in, like, the whole issue of the election and, like, the Mueller probe, um, I think the Democratic establishment was hoping that we could prove that these were all, there was this Russian influence and all just bad people and we can lock them up and go back to business as usual and clearly that's not going to happen uh, or that's that story is not going to be borne out I don't think uh, but that's again that's threatening to the establishment to, to, to be in, forced to re reassess what we're doing um, I mean another thing that kind of blew my mind is a few years ago Frederick Cruz published another book another Freud bashing book, but it got published by a, a commercial press. It was like, Frederick Cruz just keeps saying the same things over and over and over again. Why would anybody want to buy another book by Frederick Cruz? And, and yet a commercial publisher chose to publish it. So there's some investment in bashing psychoanalysis by everybody. And I think we need to be asking ourselves what what that is about, but um, at the American Psychoanalytic, they're not very interested in that question. So, um, no, you're right. It's more about maintaining rather than everyone looking at their shit. Yeah, yeah. it's like the question is it, it, to, to to bring in a parallel to that. DSM thing I was talking about. The question is: Is three sessions 
a week good enough to a step for an analysis or does it need to be four? You know, it's, it's really kind of a, I think a meaningless question. It's, there's, uh, and, but it's, they can't get off that. It's very discouraging. So I've kind of moved away from that world a lot. <clears throat> but anyway. Me too. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shoot, you're in Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to be the keynote speakers at uh, SIPS? At SIP? Um, I think... I think that there's panels that are of like the SIP members oh, rather okay. than like a specific keynote, like Patricia's in SIP, Patricia Jovici and Jameson Webster and Marcus Colon and Alyssa Martyr and then uh, Cecilia Soron, who's the person who organized it here. Um, oh. And Jacob Sternberg, I can't remember his last name. Um, but the organizers, so they, they had the one in New York and the New York kind of members organized it. They had one in Brazil. There's some Brazilian members oh, right, a couple right. years ago. So they have it in different places depending on who's organizing it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And then Lena Osted is also having a conference here the next weekend after on uh, psychoanalysis and politics. Really? Is psychoanalysis a big thing in Stockholm or um well apparently it used to be like my husband went to analysis five days a week uh for five years um and it was like in the system you know but now it's more like CBT oriented apparently so yeah. people aren't doing it within the system like that anymore yeah. Um, but I have met a couple of analysts, but it's small. I mean, it's smaller. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's true everywhere. Yeah. And I haven't, I know that there must be Lacanian somewhere. I know there's one in Gothenburg, but I haven't met Lacanians yet. The analysts I've met are IPA analysts. Well, okay. Huh. All right. Well, is your lunch hour over? It, yeah, it's. I'm expecting my next person here in a minute. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm uh, usually well, pretty manic, and I put them together immediately because otherwise I get paranoid that something's going to happen to the file or something. Oh. So this is what I'll do tonight. Oh, oh, gosh, that's quick. All right. Well. It was great talking to you. I wish I could be there for that conference. That would be neat. Yeah, was the, fun. the SIPs yeah. wasn't that wasn't the like the La La conference was what I went to that yeah, weekend. Yeah, that was part that was of it. Same. Okay, right, all right. Yeah, that's where I met Philip Van Halda and those guys. Yeah, yeah. I think I really they're going to be there too. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, say hi to him. Uh, but uh, anyway, this has been kind of fun. So it's fun. It's, yeah. Turn so. turn the lens around on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get and you get to talk. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, I've become much more. Um, yeah, I'm. I well. I've got a few more minutes if that's okay. But yeah. I, I've i resigned from the faculty of my institute uh, because I was very frustrated with this politics as usual. I'm kind of interested in finding other ways to get people into psychoanalysis. I mean, the way the system is set up now, you have to be sort of uh, totally devoted um, and I've met people, lots of people who have, are trained is just, you know, they, their training in therapy is totally without psychoanalysis, but they are aware of things missing from their training. And they, they kind of question what's going on. And 
those people are never going to wholeheartedly join a psychoanalytic institute between the cost and the, you know, just just the blind devotion that's expected and the work. But, and the time, and I find because most people go after they have their doctorate, and then you're like in your 30s, and people are starting families, and it's really hard to like have a full time job as a doctor and do this at night with the family, you know. Well, and and like if I mean the cost of education now is such if if I were just getting out of my psychiatric training today, there's no way I could think about doing analytic training because I have all this debt I got to pay back. And so it's a, yeah, it's just not a practical way to move forward. So I know in France, there's a sort of, I was, I was looking for it just now, but there's an, an alliance of psychoanalysis that's not tied to formal training programs. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in finding a way to make that work. And I think lots of people are. And, and I also don't think it's going to be less rigorous than the formal training because the formal training involves so much just devotion, just kind of blind devotion, which is not a good quality for a psychoanalyst to have, I don't think. Um, no, it needs to be the desire. That's the thing with the three, three days a week or four days a week argument. It's like, is the patient in treatment? <laughs> Yeah. Are they coming and engaged in their treatment? That's what's right. important. <laughs> Once a month could be better. You could have somebody five times a week, and it's nothing compared to somebody who's doing once a month. You know, it's, it, it, hypothetically, I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to know more about that in the Alliance of France because that's what I've been saying. I'm going to make like Das Umbahagen International now. Oh, okay. So maybe we can form an international right. network, or maybe we can do some sort of study group online with people that are newer, or something like that. Oh, that would be really great. I yeah, we did that Lacan reading online before. Yeah, we did. It, yeah, us. Yeah, you and yeah, you. Last time I was talking to you, I was talking to Ernest Smith at the same time. So, all right. Okay. Well, good. Well, then let let's keep talking about that because I definitely. I've talked to people and they're very interested. I'm, I want to make something happen that way. All right, let's do it. Okay, well, have fun at SIPS and we'll be talking. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Todd Dean. For more please visit our website, renderingunconscious.org, our publisher's website, trapart.net, or my website, drvanessasinclair.net. Speak, the body of surfaces, the alchemy of pandrogyny, synthesis incarnate, polymorphous perversity. This idea runs parallel with the concept of the cut-up, which also creates a gap. Let's begin with the individual. The identity ego is an illusion. The self is experienced as fragmented and the sense of cohesive identity is formed through fantasy. 
sung schools of never before has a generation felt such a rage to live, destroy gender, destroy the control to the happiness of the race. I will try to describe his power to you and you shall teach the rest of the world what I am teaching you. Contact throughout our lives of DNA and the expected. Every man and woman is a man and woman. Briar Peorage transgress limits throughout our lifespan. We are born into a story, an already existing narrative. Even before we are born, our little differently via his parents, family and society have ideas of who we will be, what we will do, how we will child experiences herself and body as fragmented. But when she sees herself in the mirror, the mirror image appears to be whole. As the child's experience of her own mindset of the facilitator will always be different. And in this slice of imperfection, self and the image in the mirror. This experience of disconnection continues throughout succeed and what trials we may face all before we have even left our mother's body. We mirror image. The child is able to internalize the cohesive sense of self that she imagines the mirror self-image to have, which thus forms the idea ego. We identify with what we imagine ourselves to perceive. The ego identity is therefore an identification with a fantasy. Always be a shred of difference. When tracing and retracing, the lines will never, mother sitting beside her, searching for a signal that her perception is accurate. That truly generative, this whole person she sees in the mirror is in fact a reflection of herself. Once the mother provides affirmation of this, the child turns her attention back to the mirror image, confirming that this perception is indeed herself, thereby reifying her identity or subjugated in utero. Our identity is prescribed and not with us in mind. It is mapped, however, the position of what we more accurately would consider to be the true self out for us, structured, put into play, and is largely based on gender. The first question asked of us, is it a boy or a girl, leaves no room for ambiguity. Boys have penises, ego, and the real of the body, perception, and the unconscious, sexuality, and death continue to force people into categories we've deemed socially acceptable. The system is fantasy as we attempt to produce an experience of a cohesive body self-identification. In built on dichotomy, male-female, active-passive, one-zero, master-slave. But what happens when we begin to break down this system push boundaries, surpass borderlines, and the skin is cut. The ego is our symptom. It is the scaffolding. But we as subjects are situated in the gap, in the space. This is why identity is malleable. If identity can be understood as identification with a fantasy, of what we imagine ourselves and our mothers to perceive us to be, which is then solidified by the repetition of similar experiences that they could more fully identify with. The wholeness of the mirror image 
in each other. Characteristics and mold our identity in a different way. In a way we choose, rather than being products of the system into which we are born. The future will know their own kind. Nature that yourself be possessed by in New York City, currently representing via our travel, togetherness, proximity, silence, resonance, whether at a luxury hotel, ridiculously person is accomplished. Imagine the energy in a ritual performed by tens of thousands of people around the world at the same time. Repercussions this often has. Yet, rather than exalt the hermaphroditic, as has been done in times past, we identify by cutting up their own selves as individuals, thereby recreating this fragmentation while concurrently creating a mirror image in one another. Through this, a union went well beyond what the artists anticipated. We are also beginning slowly to explore the surprisingly profound effects of being so lost, so totally and lovingly in the ritual or attend the next analytic session. When we exit our daily program, we're the European academic tradition and made them aware of their personal genius.